All right, let's get started. Hello there. Welcome to the LA Data Science Meetup. My name is Silard. I'm the host today. And I'm really excited about this one, just like the one uh, last time. So this one, it will be about light GBM. Last time we had uh, two talks, uh, one introducing uh, and doing an overview of various gradient boosting libraries. And then we had also a talk uh, about XGBoost from one of the core maintainer and developer. And now we are so lucky to have uh, a talk about Flight GBM. Uh, the speaker will be James Lamb. He is a um, software engineer at Saturn Cloud, but most importantly for us, he is a core developer and maintainer of uh, Light GBM. So we will hear a uh, first account of developments uh, in the Light GBM uh, projects. James, are you there? Yeah, I'm ready. Can you hear me okay? All right. So uh, let's uh, give a warm welcome to James. <laughs> Great, thank you very much. All right, I think you can uh, take over the slides from here. Okay, great. I think you have to give me the right to share. <laughs> um, I think I need, oh, I need maybe to pause share, no. Stop share, okay. Okay, perfect. Okay, uh, good morning, or at least it's it's morning here in Chicago. Uh, hello to everybody, wherever you're calling in from. Um, so my name's James Lamb. I uh, have been working as a maintainer on LightGBM for a few years. I um, was not involved in creating the LightGBM algorithm or anything like that, but I've been working on the team that maintains the software for a couple of years. And what I'd like to talk about today are some of the newest things in LightGBM. So some of these things, they're exciting, and I'll also try to make a point to say when they are experimental, when they still need a lot of work, and when they need um, talented data scientists like you all to test them. So let's get into it. Um, you can find me at Twitter and on GitHub here. I'll share all that at the end as well. Okay, so before I start, um, I just want to mention I'm an engineer at Saturn Cloud. At Saturn Cloud, we work on a managed Dask and Kubernetes offering. So if you've ever used Databricks for Spark, uh, we do something similar, but for Dask. So I'll be talking about Dask, but my, my opinions in this talk are my own, not necessarily Saturn's. Okay, so let's start with a brief overview of LightGBM. Um, I want to make sure to uh, accommodate people who maybe are not super familiar with LightGBM, just give you a, a brief understanding of what the library is, what it does. I think it'll make the rest of the content make a lot more sense. So LightGBM stands for Lightweight Gradient Boosting Machine. It was introduced in uh, these two papers. You can find these links. You can search these on Google Scholar or find these links in the LightGBM repo. Um, and when we say gradient boosting machine, this little picture here explains what's happening. So LightGBM is a tree-based supervised learning algorithm where you train trees one at a time. And then the boosting part is in that each tree is trained on, you can think of it basically as the residuals from the model up to that tree. And you get a prediction by adding the outputs of the trees together. So um, for those of you who've worked with something like random forest, this is very different than that. So you're kind of going one step at a time, uh, training <coughs> iterative models and each iteration is a tree. Just keep that in mind. So LightGPM is maintained by a small global team. Um, we have people in Australia, in the United States, in Russia, in China, in France. Um, and so there, you know, we're in many different time zones, people, and we also have different specializations. So um, these are the names that you'll see when you come to the LightGBM repo and you're asking questions and issues or you're opening PRs and getting review comments. So please be kind. They're all very nice people and mostly volunteering their time. Okay, so similar to other machine learning libraries that you've worked with, LightGBM is primarily implemented in C++. And then you may interact with it through many other extensions. So there is a LightGBM CLI, there's an R package, there's a Python package that um, 
very recently took on support for Dask. We'll talk about that a little bit later. You can uh, get a Java interface via Swig. You can use the MML Spark library to use LightGBM in Spark. And then there are other projects that we don't maintain, the maintainers of LightGBM don't maintain, um, that take advantage of other languages' ability to bind to C++ libraries. So you can go use other packages to train LightGBM models in Julia, Go, Rust, C Sharp, all kinds of stuff. Um, and all of these things are documented in the LightGBM repo. OK, so I want to talk a little bit about how LightGBM does what it does, some of its key features. Um, I think it'll make the rest of the features that I talk about later make a little bit more sense. So first, LightGBM grows trees uh, leaf-wise or um, in XGBoost, you may have seen them describe this as, I think it's like loss guided or something like that. Um, and what that means is when you set your max depth in growing a tree, you shouldn't think about LightGBM as growing a balanced tree. So LightGBM will add one node at a time to a tree. And then the next node that it adds will just be based on the gain of adding that node, regardless of the depth. And so what that means is for LightGBM, for a given number of leaves, LightGBM is going to produce trees that are deeper and less balanced than other methods that are creating a, a balanced tree. So you can see in this little picture from the LightGBM docs um, that after we had added this first split right here, LightGBM might make a choice to split again on this green node and go deeper here instead of expanding this other level. So something to keep in mind when you're thinking about um, setting something like max depth in LightGBM. It's a little different than maybe other tree-based algorithms that you've worked with. OK, so one reason that LightGBM is fast is because it buckets continuous features into histograms. I took this picture from uh, a really good blog post called What Makes LightGBM Fast. Um, you can look this up by the author's name, or if you get these slides, I'll share a link to that later. The link is in the speaker notes. Um, but let's look at this example, right? So when a tree-based model constructs trees, it has to evaluate a set of decisions, a set of uh, what we call split points, which is a combination of a feature and a threshold. So the tree has to decide, okay, would I be improved by adding a split like feature five greater than 10 or something like that? And for non-histogram based methods, there are a lot more splits to consider. So think about this very, very simple example. You might have to consider uh, a split right here between two and three, between three and five, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So what LightGBM does is in pre-processing one time before training starts, it takes continuous features and it buckets them into histograms. And the methods for that, um, I'll be honest, I don't even fully understand. You know, I'm not a, I don't have a machine learning PhD. Uh, they're documented in the LightGBM paper. But what that means is that LightGBM has to explore far fewer splits than other algorithms that don't take advantage of that. And the representation of that data can be a lot smaller and cheaper uh, to hold in memory. So this is one of the features that makes LightGBM fast. And the paper shows some, res the paper shows some results that suggest that um, you actually don't give up a ton of statistical performance of accuracy by doing this. LightGPM also has some nice built-in features for handling sparse features. So sparse features, this means features which when one of them is non-zero, the other one tends to be zero. Um, LightGPM has a fuzzy notion of this. It isn't quite as rigid as what you see in this picture, again, from this blog post. Um, but the idea is the same. So when you're thinking about that number of split points to, to explore as a determinant of how fast the model runs, well, the number of split points is partially a feature of the number of features, excuse me, a function of the number of features, right? So you can see if you had a, a simple matrix like this with feature one and feature two, these can actually be efficiently combined into one vector without losing any information. And so what LightGBM will do is it has an algorithm for searching combinations like this to reduce the number of features that training considers. And you can see that what happened here is the values of feature one are preserved. And then the values of feature two have the maximum of feature one added to them. So we know when you see this new feature bundle feature, that values greater than four actually came from feature two. So this is a neat little trick that LightGBM does to reduce its uh, memory consumption and training time. From an early point, LightGBM supported distributed uh, multi-node learning. So what that means is if you want to bring more computational resources to bear on a training problem, 
or your data set is larger than the computers that are single computers that are available to you, you can use multiple machines at the same time to all contribute to training a light GBM uh, model. And so this is done with um, an implementation that's completely baked into light GBM. This isn't maybe a library that we vendor in or something like that. Um, and you can think of this as kind of like using the reduce scatter operation that you might be familiar with from the MPI collective operations. So each worker, each of these things that says rank, think of this as a different worker machine. Each worker contains a different, uh, different chunk of the data in one of these training modes and responsibility for doing the relevant work on each of those different pieces. I have documented a lot more details on this process in this tutorial. You can find this link in the slides. And there are also some good details about this in the LightGBM docs. But keep this picture in mind when we talk about Dask a little bit later in the talk. OK. That is the very, very quick overview of what LightGBM is and does. From this point forward, I want to talk about some new features. And then I'll end this little bit of the talk with a demo of the new Dask interface. One other thing before I start this, you're going to see some things on these slides that say coming in 3.2.0. The latest release of LightGBM is 3.1.1. That's the latest release that we, we consider to be stable, performant, reliable. You can get that from package managers. Some of the features I'm going to talk about in the next couple of slides are only available from building from source from GitHub. So first, let's talk about the experience of using LightGBM on GPUs. A little bit of history. So the first um, GPU support was added to LightGBM in April 2017. And that support used a project called OpenCL. So OpenCL is a project for um, basically writing code that wraps a C or C++ library that can then be compiled against a bunch of different hardware targets, uh, including many different types of GPU. And so that was done in, uh, based on the research in this paper by the main author of this paper um, and has been in LightGBM for a few years now. So if you've used LightGBM GPU mode from any release of LightGBM, you've used this OpenCL implementation. Um, and it works on a bunch of different GPU architectures. However, that OpenCL implementation, it's not ideal for uh, newer NVIDIA GPUs. And so a team from IBM came in um, starting near the middle of last year, if I remember correctly. Yeah, June, June 2020, near the middle of last year, and um, contributed CUDA kernels to LightGBM. So what they did is they, they took LightGBM's internal, like the key classes where you have to decide whether they run on CPU or GPU. And they added CUDA kernels so that you can get a CUDA-based build of LightGBM. And that will be able to run with newer versions of CUDA on newer NVIDIA GPUs. Now, this is the first time that I have to stop and hedge very hard. This should be considered experimental at this point. Um, I have some notes in the speaker notes, and I'd be happy to, to you know, share notes over email or Twitter or whatever for how to get get started building this and testing this. This feature is still being actively developed. Um, we are still working on tests. We're still fixing some, some bugs. So this should be considered very experimental, but also very exciting. And that'll be coming in the next release of LightGBM. Um, so this gives you an idea of what you have to do today to build this. Uh, all of this code will be available in the slides. This process will get better before it's released. Um, and hopefully, people will have a good experience. At the end of the talk, I'm going to talk about how to contribute to LightGBM. But I want to kind of tell you right now and get this hook in you. If you have experience with CUDA, we could use your help. Thank you. OK. Um, OK, another feature that's been added recently that will be coming in 3.2.0 is a single wheel for the CPU and GPU support in the Python package. So this is another feature that should be considered experimental. And it currently only works on Windows. But what this does is on Windows, you just run pip install LightGBM. And as long as you have the right OpenCL stuff installed, you're going to get one wheel that will work for both uh, GPU and CPU. So you won't have to build two versions of LightGBM based on whether you're working on the CPU or the GPU. Um, we're looking forward to developing this more, hopefully making it work on more operating systems, hopefully making it work on um, a wider range of GPUs. But this is really, really exciting. And I just want to shout out, this feature was contributed by an outside contributor, not, not a maintainer. So um, really, really, really cool work. I hope that for those of you on Windows, that's an exciting development. 
Okay, let's talk about R next. So R, um, R is the first programming language that I learned, the first one I really fell in love with. And so I'm really excited to tell you that LightGMM R package is now available on CRAN. And I'll show you that here. So you can get it from CRAN just like you get other R packages, you know, installed R packages like GBM. Um, and this is new as of LightGBM 3.1.0. So this has been, uh, the first release to CRAN was in December. So just about a month and a half. Um, if any of you follow me on Twitter, you know that, you know, this was a long road. There were many ups and downs. It was kind of an emotional roller coaster, but, uh, but we got there. And what I hope is that the R package being on CRAN will help us to fight through this reputation that LightGBM's R package has earned as being difficult to install. So if you look back into the LightGBM issues or on Stack Overflow prior to, say, summer 2020, you're going to see that most of the issues for the R package are, I can't install this, or I installed it and it seg faults immediately and kills my R studio, or things like this. Um, this is because our previous, our non-CRAN based build, while it can produce a more efficient library, it is not necessarily built for portability. It relies on you like setting up a lot of paths correctly, installing some of your own software. Um, thankfully, we have not had, you know, I'm going to, I know I'm going to curse myself by saying this. We haven't had any issues like that with the CRAN package so far. Um, okay, and so what you should expect is that this package being on CRAN makes the LightGBM R package faster and easier to install. Um, so CRAN puts a high, high price on, or I guess a high value on portability. And so that means that LightGBM had to pass a lot of checks that it runs on, you know, 32-bit Windows systems, that it runs on Solaris 10, that it runs on Linux with different compilers. So you should expect that the the R package from CRAN is highly portable and should work on most setups. CRAN also gives us pre-compiled binaries for Windows and Mac. So um, if you're a Windows or a Mac user and you do install that packages like GBM, it should be very quick. You should get a pre-compiled binary and not have to wait for it to compile. You can also use, RStudio has set up something called the RStudio Package Manager that is creating experimental pre-compiled binaries for Linux systems. I haven't tested that yet for LightGBM, but I believe that they're mirroring all of CRAN, so it might be something to consider. And what that means is you can install LightGBM without CMake and without having to clone the repo. Okay, so how do you pick, right? We haven't completely caught over to CRAN, and we have no, um, no intention of only supporting CRAN for the R package. We still support a CMake-based build for the R package. We still support a build that, for example, uses uh, the compilers from Visual Studio. And so what I would say is you should prefer to install from the CRAN package if what you want is easy installation. But if you care a lot about performance, if you want to build today, for example, a GPU enabled version of the R package, or if you want to use those like Visual Studio compilers or something else, um, then you should prefer building from source. And we have documentation on how to do that. Okay, there's a long story, a lot of stuff that went into the CRAN package. I won't bore this audience with it, but the, the kind of overarching big thing that had to change is that LightGBM is a CMake build project. We use CMake as our build tool to uh, link in libraries and create all of the different artifacts that LightGBM creates. Um, CMake has only very, very little support on CRAN. It's kind of unorthodox to have a package on CRAN with CMake. And so we had to rewrite some of the build tool chain for the CRAN R package using something called GNU AutoConf. I think that the details of that are bigger than this talk, um, but I have given a talk in the past where we go way, way, way into the details of this. Um, for those of you who've read the writing R extensions tutorial from CRAN, uh, I call this Road to CRAN talk a dramatic interpretation of writing R extensions. So if you're interested in that, you can go to this link and watch that talk. But if you're new to R, don't watch that talk because it'll scare you. OK, I just want to point you really quickly to another new development in my GBM. We've added an expanded document on hyperparameter tuning. And this is in progress. This is still being developed. Um, but what we've tried to do is to give more intuition around the different values of the hyperparameter, hyperparameters and how they interact with each other. So. Um, 
before we started doing this, most of this documentation, it assumed a lot of prior knowledge about LightGBM and about gradient boosted decision trees. These descriptions now have a little bit more depth for people who are maybe not that familiar with the internals of LightGBM or XGBoost or, or libraries with it. So you can find that in the official LightGBM documentation. Please check that out. And if you find any issues with it, please submit pull requests. Okay. The last new feature I'd like to talk about is one that I have an emotional attachment to and I'm really, really excited about, and that is distributed training in Python using Dask. So before this feature was added, you could do distributed training in LightGBM um, using the LightGBM CLI. That's, that's been around for a few years. Um, or you could use MML Spark, or you could use some projects that are not maintained by my LightGBM maintainers like uh, Kubeflow trainer, uh, training operators or things like that. Um, but now you're gonna be able to do this using Dask, train LightGBM models on Dask data frames and Dask currents. So let's, let's talk a little bit about that. Okay, a very, very quick introduction to Dask for those who aren't familiar. So most of the popular data science libraries in Python, they were first designed for use in a physical machine. So think about the first time you did data science in Python, what are the libraries you used? You use scikit-learn, you used NumPy, um, maybe you used SciPy, maybe you used stats models. These were all designed to work on a single machine and to work on CPUs. But once you get to larger data sets or you just wanna bring a lot more uh, processing power onto a data set, then these libraries maybe are not exactly the right choice. Um, and you can actually get into this situation really quickly. You know, Don't, don't necessarily assume that uh, big data or large data sets means something fantastical that's measured in, in petabytes or terabytes. Um, if you've ever seen the famous Wes McKinney talk, 10 Things I Hate About Pandas or read the blog post, he said in that talk something that is still true today that you should expect for a given size of data set on disk that you need five to 10 times as, many, as much that RAM, uh, excuse me, five to 10 times as much RAM to fit that data set in pandas in memory. So you can hit the limits of your laptop, your kind of workstation, pretty quickly. And so this is where Dask comes in. Dask has really similar goals and features to Spark, where it wants to give you an API that looks and feels like you're operating on data that's just in your machine, but it actually is distributing those computations over a cluster of machines. One of the really nice things about Dask, compared with maybe using PySpark, is that Dask has a collection of libraries that try very hard to maintain API parity with the libraries in the PyData ecosystem. So what that means is that a DAS data frame is intentionally, it intentionally looks very, very similar to a pandas data frame. A Dask array looks like a NumPy array. The models in Dask ML, you know, the grid search CV from Dask ML looks and feels like scikit-learn. And that's partially because the developers from those PyData libraries are also maintainers in the Dask ecosystem. Um, and then Dask has a couple of other interesting things. I think the other biggest selling point for Dask compared to say PySpark is everything is Python all the way down in Dask. And so no reading gross uh, Scala stack traces. You're getting Python errors all the way down. Okay, so the way that Dask works in a distributed setting is that you have a client on your machine. That client knows about data and it knows about work. It sends that work to something called a scheduler. The scheduler then looks at workers and says, hey, workers do this stuff. And it reports the results to the client. So. Just keep this picture in mind. That's a very high level yeah, overview. Um, and keep in mind that these schedulers and workers in Dask, they're just Python processes. So you can run a Dask cluster just on one machine uh, almost as easily as you can run it on a distributed cluster. I know that's like a big, big statement. Almost is doing a lot of work in that sentence, but um, it really is not too difficult to, to run up a couple of these commands on your machine. And I'm gonna do that in a minute to show you. One of the things that's powerful about Dask is that there's many different ways to run a Dask cluster. So if you already have an existing Spark cluster, if you already have um, HDFS, you may be using Yarn as a resource negotiator. You can create a Dask cluster using Yarn to provision workers. So you can just hook in uh, right into there and use Dask on your existing Spark cluster. You can use it on high performance computing clusters um, like Slurm or something like that. You can deploy it into Kubernetes clusters with something like the Dask Helm chart or the Dask Kubernetes project. Um, and you can deploy Dask clusters on most of the large cloud providers. So 
The DAS Cloud Provider Library, for example, it has pretty easy to get started with examples for creating a DAS cluster on AWS, on GCP, on um, Azure was recently added, DigitalOcean. Um, so there are a lot of different ways to get started with DAS. And I think one of the really powerful things is that the way that you provision your cluster doesn't really change anything about the way you write your code. Um, because of this kind of barrier between the, the, the scheduler, the client, and then your code, the stuff that reads and writes data frames and trains models and, and does cool data science-y stuff. Okay, so the way that Dask works is that all work is arranged into an ordered task graph where Dask basically creates this ordered graph of futures. Futures are function calls with arguments. Just think of them like that. And then Dask will understand which function calls can be evaluated in parallel and which rely on upstream computations. And it will handle having all the workers do the work that you described to it. When you use the built-in collections in Dask, like the Dask array or the Dask bag or the Dask data frame, these are higher level abstractions that look like pandas data frames that look like numpy arrays, um, but that when you do operations like sum or, or head or something like that, they actually get turned into one of those Dask task graphs. So uh, the framework there is kind of handling the magic of distributing that work over the cluster. And you just kind of write code that pretty much looks like numpy or, or pandas code that you're used to writing. Um, and I really, really like this image from the DAS docs to explain that. So when you work with these collections, like in this example, a DAS array, the DAS array looks like a single numpy array to you, but it's actually a collection of individual numpy arrays that DAS then knows how to stitch together. Okay, so we have DAS as the kind of base level thing, setting up a cluster. We have DAS creating uh, graphs of work. We have these distributed collections like arrays and data frames. The next higher level of abstraction is machine learning libraries. So um, for a little while now, there have been these projects in the DAS org called DAS Light GBM and DAS XGBoost. Those projects are going away. So DAS XGBoost has been um, completely absorbed into XGBoost's own Python library. So you can use XGBoost.DAS to get access to um, a DAS interface for XGBoost that is maintained by the XGBoost maintainers and that keeps pace with development there. We're a couple of months behind that in LightGBM, but we've started on the same process. So um, in this pull request um, about two months ago, one of the main maintainers from DAS LightGBM came and um, merged all of DAS LightGBM, or at least the core pieces, into LightGBM. So in the next release of LightGBM, you'll be able to just uh, import LGBM regressor, this is actually wrong. You'll see in my example. But you'll be able to import this lightgbm.dask module just from an installation of lightgbm. No other packages that have to be installed. And then you'll be able to train lightgbm models on dask arrays and dask data frames. And next, what I want to do is show you a quick demo of how that works. So I've already uh, spun up a notebook here. You know, This is like those cooking shows you watch where they say, put the turkey in the oven, and then a minute later, they're like, here's the turkey, it's out of the oven. Uh, but all of the code to spin this up, just to prove to you that I didn't do a lot of complicated stuff, is available on my GitHub. Um, it has a permissive license. You can do whatever you want with the code, and I'll share that link in a couple minutes. So I'm sitting here inside of a Jupyter notebook on my laptop. I've installed LightGBM from source, and I'm going to load it up. And first, I'm going to create a LightGBM local cluster. So local cluster is a DAS cluster that's basically just uh, each worker is a process on my machine. And we can go look in the DAS diagnostic dashboard to see that. So you can see I have my four workers. They each have a little bit of uh, stuff to do, but we really haven't given them much data. Next, I'm going to create what's called a DAS array. So you notice the cell com completed immediately. And the memory utilization in the cluster hasn't changed at all. If we look around, the worker's memory utilization hasn't changed at all, right? There's nothing going on here. That's because Dask Array, so you can see this kind of looks just like numpy code. Right now, this Dask Array is lazy. That means it's just a collection of function calls that once they're computed, will actually initialize a large random array. But right now, they're just sitting there kind of waiting. So next one I'm going to do, and let's, let me try to split screen this. 
Next, what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell Dask, all right, I'm ready for this data. Go actually walk through that graph and compute everything. And now it's going to do some work. There's going to be some tasks here. It went very fast because it's just random. But now you can see that the workers have a little bit of, of stuff in memory. Now they have a little bit of data. And if we look at the task graph, you can see that a couple of these tasks ran. So this is just some uh, tasks built into Dask, Dask array that are creating random samples just like I asked for. And that data is now all living in the cluster. So in this case, that cluster happens to also be on this laptop. But if I had used a different type of cluster, like one on AWS or GCP or Azure, uh, then all that data would be living there. And I, it wouldn't matter how large my laptop was. OK, next I'm going to create a Dask LGBM regressor. So this should look very familiar to you if you've ever used the LightGBM scikit-learn interface. Um, it's intended to look as similar as possible to the normal non-Dask version of LightGBM. And so I'm going to create this regressor class, give it my usual LightGBM parameters, and then let's see what happens when I call fit. And I'm going to close my Slack so those notifications stop coming up. OK, now we have some stuff going on. Let's go look at the task graph. So you can see we have three tasks here called train part. Excuse me, four tasks. It's a little hard to see. Four tasks. That's one per worker. And this will go away quickly. So what happened was each worker process had a chunk of the data. It had a piece of that total array. And it contributed to the training process based only on that piece of data that it had available. And this trained pretty quickly on, I don't know, what was it? A million rows and 100 features. I mean, that's not, that's not so small. Um, and you can see that what this gives you back is a fitted instance of this Dask LGB, LGBM regressor class. Now, if you want to go and save this model and you want to go deploy it and, and do the things you've already been doing with um, the non-Dask version of LightGBM, you can run this method to local. And that's going to give you a regular non-Dask LightGBM scikit-learn LGBM regressor model object. And then you can examine, for example, the booster out in there. And you can see some details about the tree. So uh, let me move this over here. And let's take a look. Um, and so you can see some details about the model. This isn't going to be very interesting because my features are all just random and they're called like column one, column two. Um, but this is just done to prove to you that this Dask version of doing distributed training for LightGBM will produce a local model that you can work with just like you did for anything else. And so what that means is Dask won't be a required dependency for however you set up uh, model serving and inference. You'll be able to deploy this model exactly the same way that you deployed other LightGBM models. Um, OK, and then I have another example in here that I'm not going to run today. Um, but there is another example in here. If you want to try on a truly distributed cluster, you can use this example and some of the notes in this readme to deploy a cluster onto AWS Fargate, if you have an AWS account, using Dask Cloud Provider. And I'll kind of leave that as an exercise for the user. OK, view. OK. So that is the extent of what I wanted to cover, the kind of new things happening in LightGBM that I wanted to show. Before I open it up for questions and answers, I just would like to make one pitch to you. And that's that LightGBM needs your help. So we accept contributions of all sizes from developers of all skill levels. So if you're interested in contributing to LightGBM, but you've told yourself, I don't have anything to offer, or I've never done open source before. I'm not really sure how it works. I recommend that you look at some of these good first issues. You can tag me personally in any of the issues and ask for help. I will help you. Uh, we're really, we're really, really interested in bringing more contributors and collaborators into this project um, because otherwise, this project is is really not going to evolve as fast as we'd like it to, and it's not going to evolve in maybe a good direction for the community. So if you kind of just want to dip your toe into LightGBM, these good first issues are, are a good place to start. If you feel comfortable working on slightly larger tasks, we have all of our feature requests documented here. If you have experience with Dask and Dask ML um, or with CUDA, we really, really, really could use your help. The things that I showed you today the CUDA-based GPU builds and the Dask interface, they are the new, some of the newest things in LightGPM. They are still experimental. 
and there are still some rough edges there. So if you have experience in those things, we would greatly, greatly appreciate contributions. And if you have any questions about getting started, you can email me, you can contact me on LinkedIn, you can contact me on Twitter, you can tag me in one of these issues and I'll help you get started. With that, I wanna thank you all for, for the time. I know it was a lot of material. Um, hopefully, they, hopefully you found it interesting. You can find all of the demo code, including that demo that I mentioned that you can run in AWS um, in my talks repo at this link. And with that, I think I'll open it up for questions. All right, uh, thank you, James, for this fantastic talk. So I'm uh, really looking forward to, there are already a lot of questions, so uh, uh, let's get started. Just one second. So you unshared the screen, so that uh, messed up my chat. <laughs> Uh, oh, sorry. Do you want me to share again? My window somehow the it resized. Hold on. Uh, oh, I can share my screen again. No, like. no, that's good. Okay, okay. I, I, I got it now. All right. So we have, yeah. I, I I will not start in order. There are already like six, seven questions. Okay. So uh, let's start with uh, Philip. It's great to have Philip again. So he was uh, the speaker last time on XG Boost. So he has some questions to you. Sure. Um, uh, so he says, uh, have you figured out how to enable GPU support in CRAN build? Um, the, the, the short answer is no. We have not figured out how to add GPU support in the CRAN build. The long answer is I've thought about it and I think it's possible. So there are two things that you need to do. For sure, that has to be an option. GPU support in the CRAN build, it has to be an optional feature. You're not gonna be able to test that on CRAN. And I know how to do kind of how to add configure arguments that can get passed through to auto tools. Um, there is a section of writing R extensions on a project supported by CRAN called package config that lets you go search for external dependencies. So for example, if you use like R PostgreSQL, they have to have a way to declare that you've already installed um, lib p sql or whatever it's called right so i think it will be possible to add and to say go search for in our case opencl but we haven't we haven't tried that yet and it um for me personally i've been focusing more on dask next so have not figured out how to do that yet yeah that's actually his next question but he also said that so far we've been telling people to build from source if they want to use GPU from XG. We, like yeah, that. we do the same thing. So we have um, one thing I should show, actually. I, I, we have a very, very small improvement to that that I should show. Um, what's the easiest way to show this? Probably in the readme. So we have our build from source process. We have an R script at the root of the repo that you call. And you can pass a command line argument, use GPU to this. So as long as you have CMake and you have OpenCL on your path, which like easier than said than done, I understand. Uh, you can do something, let me zoom this up. You can do something like R script, build R dot R, use GPU from the root of LightGPM and that'll build. But yeah, we also have been encouraging people to build from source for GPUs. All right, great. So Philip's next question is, do you have a plan to make GPU algorithm available from light gbm desk interface so i would say we don't have a we don't have a plan for making the gpu algorithm available from the uh, desk interface what i mean is there's not an issue that i can point you to where we've written that down but i think that i believe maybe philip can correct me i believe that the fact that we're now going to have a cuda based build means there's an option for us to link into desk kudf and to make you know, light GPM on Dask with Kudia, Dask QDF data frames possible. I think that it will be possible. It will take a lot of work and it'll take a lot of Googling on my part because that's, uh, I haven't really gone too deep into Kudia yet. So I think that it's possible, but we don't, I wouldn't say it's something you should expect in the next release uh, or maybe even in the release after that, unless it's contributed by 
an outside contributor. All right, sounds great. So here's a, it's more like a compliment than a question. This was a very, from Joseph, this was very well explained, concise and easy to follow. Thanks for putting this together. Uh, Thank you. Question from Thomas. How do you handle linking against native libraries? For example, the CUDA runtime and ensure that your Python wheels comply with the many Linux standard, which defines only a small set of libraries which can be dynamically linked against? That is a great question. I, it's a little bit outside the depth of my knowledge, but I'll tell you a couple things. The first is that we do not ship wheels that have support for CUDA. So we, the only wheels that we, that we ship, the, those experimental GPU and CPU bundled wheels are OpenCL based. Um, beyond that, I, I don't know that I know enough to answer your question, but I can point you to the place in the code where that's done if you'd like to go look for yourself. Um, and that is right here. Um, so you can go look into these CI scripts and see how we build the wheels. And then the one other thing that I'll show you is like most um, high profile open source Python packages, our setup.py has a ton of stuff in it. Um, and you'll be able to see in here some of the other customization that we do for linking. So. Uh, our builds of our wheels are CMake based, so you can also look at the root level CMake list. But all of this is a long way of me telling you I don't actually know how to answer your question because it's not a part of YGBM that I uh, have spent a lot of time working on. So I apologize for that. But please come open an issue and we'd be happy to describe it in detail and hopefully get you to come contribute things to it. All right, another compliment from Christoph. Thank you for the talk. Desk seems pretty cool. A uh, question from Steven. Uh, could you say conceptually how distributed model training works in LineGBM for GPUs and clusters? Is it the same way for both of these? Assuming that it's individual tree training that is distributed, since the GBM is a statewide model, so one tree has to be grown after the other. Okay, great question. Um, first, I am going to direct to you for more information to this tutorial that I linked to in the documentation, um, I've written one of these on XGBoost and one of these on LightGBM. And let me put that link here in larger text if people want it while I answer this question in more detail. Um, so these links, based on discussions that I've had with XGBoost maintainers, based on you know my understanding of LightGBM and things like this, they describe the process of um, parallelizing, and that also means that also can mean distributing training of gradient boosted decision trees. When you see when you say that the training is tree wise, I want to be sure to clarify exactly what's happening. The thing that is parallel parallelized and distributed is the process of selecting the next node to add to each tree. So it's not that say worker one works on one tree and worker two works on the other. Because as you noted, right, the boosting process is iterative. You have to complete tree one, then you can train tree two on, on the model's residuals before that, et cetera, et cetera, right? So um, what is parallelized is the work of deciding which split, if any, should be added to the tree next. So workers in distributed LightGBM and in distributed XGBoost, they each have some information about their own local data. They create their own um, feature histograms that include some information about how the loss function would change, basically what the gain would be of adding different splits. They each take kind of a subsection of that work. They share their kind of research results around the cluster. And then the cluster is able to make a global decision about which split point, if any, should be added to the tree next. Then there's a kind of a synchronization. Uh, and then we repeat and repeat over and over again. To the question of how that works with GPUs, I, I can't say anything authoritative about that. I personally have never done multi-node, multi-GPU, light GBM training. So I, I'm going to tell you, I can't, I'm not an authority on that. Um, based on what I've seen of how the GPU pieces of light GBM's library work, I would expect it to be able to work. And in fact, if you look at 
if you go back to where was my thing here um i believe in this paper i believe that this paper describes a way to do distributed training on gpus so i'm not i'm not not 100 percent sure but i believe so uh that's a long answer to say i've never done it i'm not sure but i'm pretty sure that it's possible and the thing that is parallelized is the decision of which uh, basically which node to add to the tree next. Yeah, and I would add that I think most of the time it takes in uh, uh, doing the histogram. So that's, that's what's actually parallelized. Uh, and then uh, that's why it works so well on GPU because there are like, uh, you can split it into thousands of threads. And that, that, that's why GPU can. Yeah, that's right. The other thing- like millions, the, millions of data points then. That's right. I think the other thing that's important to remember too is um, in documentation or stack overflow answers or, or issues, you'll see people use the words parallel and distributed interchangeably, but they're not interchangeable for this purpose. So when you're working on a single machine and you use multi-threading with XGBoost or LightGBM, those threads in some cases are still able to take advantage of shared memory. So even though they're working on different regions of the data, they're not moving data around. In the distributed context, each worker has a legit subset of the data physically. And so there is some communication overhead introduced there. So I think that's also like important to keep in mind. All right, question from Amy. Is Dask also good for data manipulation? Where do you need to bring data to local and exam each step, examine each steps? Okay, great question. Um, I have found Dask to be very fun and easy to use for data exploration. Um, and that is mainly through a project called Dask Data Frame. I shouldn't say a project. It's a core part of Dask called Dask Data Frame. So this data frame, the code that you write, it looks and feels like Pandas code, um, but it actually all executes on the cluster. And so what that means is, for example, if you have an S3 bucket or some other object store with, you know, 100 Parquet files in it, you don't need to load each of those on your local machine and then broadcast that data to the cluster. You can tell the cluster lazily, here are the URLs of 100 Parquet files in S3. Each of you take 25, if there's four workers, and load your 25 into Pandas data frames in memory, and then you can still operate on top of all that data. Um, for data, so for data manipulation, I found that DAS data frame is really good. So is DAS, uh, excuse me, DAS array. There are also projects that allow you to do data visualization on top of DAS. So for example, there's a project called RayShader that allows you to work on, oh, not RayShader. Um, what's it called? Uh, HoloViz, excuse me. I know there's another shader one that I'm blanking on right now. Uh, data shader, there you go. Uh, so there are these collections of plotting libraries from HoloViz that also understand DAS collections and allow you to do data visualization on an amount of data that's larger than what would fit on your machine. So I found it to be pretty easy to get used to and to use. Um, it's definitely not, you're never gonna be able to take a script that you have and, and replace import pandas as PD with import DAS data frame as PD, it's never like 100% that easy, but maybe 90%. So hopefully that answers the question. All right. Um, oh, I actually, could I add one other thing on that? Um, I think that you should also find for anyone who's used to working in Spark and has been burned by things working on Spark local cluster and then failing when you go to um, like a distributed Spark cluster, I found that that experience is a lot less common in Dask. So about a month ago, um, a company called Coiled, which is similar to the company that I work at Saturn, they did a meetup with Holden Corral, who's one of the um, core maintainers of Spark. And Holden described how when Spark started, they started focused on distributed work, and then they added local cluster later as a way to make their unit test work. In Dask, the opposite is true. In Dask, they started trying to just make an out of memory, a way to do out of memory computation on your machine. And then they added the distributed thing later. So you should also find that you're able to prototype on just your laptop or just an EC2 or something and have pretty good confidence that that's gonna work when you go to a distributed cluster. All right, there are so many compliments. I would just read uh, one last one. Thank you, James. This talk was uh 
concise, well organized, and very clear a model tour. And I, I, I absolutely agree. It was uh, this talk was much better than my talk last time. Oh, that's for sure. <laughs> well, th thank you very much. I appreciate that. All right, there are lots of compliments. Let's try to, I promise to finish by 55, 57, so that if people have meetings at 11, they can uh, go. Uh, let's try to cram in two more questions, maybe. Have you done any comparison between running things in a single large instance with lots of RAM to feed data versus on a dense distributed environment in terms of results mainly? That is a great question. Um, so we have done some benchmarks like that at, at Saturn, although I'll tell you what, that we, what we have not done is Dask on a single node, like a single very large machine versus Dask with a distributed cluster that has the same cumulative number of um, processors and the same amount of memory. I believe that that's a leading question to the like prop to the proposal that you might not need to do distributed work. Um, I don't personally have an opinion on that. Um, there are always cost and capacity considerations, right? So there, my experience with AWS, for example, has been that there are limits to your ability to get larger instance types or your ability to afford them that can be offset by getting, putting together a cluster of many small uh, small instance types. So to, to answer your question, I, I can't tell you, you know, definitively what the, what the additional overhead is that's introduced by going to a distributed setting. There certainly is some, right? There's communication overhead, there's provisioning time, there's data being passed. Um, one of the things that's powerful about Dask is that all of that decision is isolated at the level of setting up the client and all of the rest of your processing code, it does not have to change. It does not have to be aware of whether it's on a GKE cluster or a single big machine or your laptop or a Raspberry Pi. Um, so I think it's, it, it is fun and easy to experiment with those different things. All right, let's do a last one from Dania. I would be interested to learn more about how the effective feature bundling, bundling works if you are able to elaborate on that natively it seems to me that if you start by one hot encoding, a categorical variable, effective feature building will just crunch that back into a label encoding of that feature. Is that accurate? Um, that is not exactly accurate. So exclusive feature, it's called exclusive feature bundling. This is described in the first LightGBM paper. Let me find the name of that for you. Um, this one, LightGBM, a highly efficient gradient boosted decision tree. I recommend that you look at that. There are a couple of reasons that that's not strictly true. So first, uh, exclusive feature bundling works for categorical features and for continuous features. Um, and then secondly, the process of finding those, comb those effective combinations, it's actually a very, very difficult computational process to decide when to stop, right? To decide, like, like it, it looks simple in the example that I showed when you just have these two features and it's like very easy to see the zeros. But when you think about whether uh, the combination of these two features is then sparse when compared when this combination is compared to feature three, and then whether the combination of those three is still sparse compared to feature four, what you said about one-hot encoding is is somewhat right. Like like in a one-hot encoding sense, of course you know that they're all sparse with comparison to each other. But exclusive feature bundling is more it's more general. It's it's it works without any prior knowledge that a certain subset of columns are a one hot encoding of a single feature. So I hope that that makes sense. I recommend that you read the paper. And then if you have other questions, please come raise an issue or ask the question on LightGBM, uh, on the LightGBM tag on Stack Overflow, and we'll try to answer it. All right, I think we have to finish here. So thank you, James. And thank you, all of you who participated in the Q&A. It was really a great talk and a really great, uh, great questions and uh, great answers. I'm really very happy with this talk. So uh, we'll finish now so that if someone has meetings at uh, the hour, then uh, they can go there. The only thing I want to do is another round of applause. All right. Thank you, Thank Thank you, you. everyone. And uh, see you.
next time. All right, thank you.